Welcome to How to Survive Grief. My name is Sandra Champlain. Am I an expert in grief? Nope. I'm just a person like you who has experienced the pain of grief. However, I have been driven for the past 15 years by my fear of dying that I've done a lot of research on the topic of grief, and I question, could there be life after death? The purpose of this CD is, first and foremost, to ease some of the pain you are feeling if you are currently grieving. Although this CD was designed to help someone through the pain and death of a loved one, it will also make a difference if you're experiencing grief from a loss of a job, a divorce, or a breakup in a relationship, or perhaps a change in your health. Let me first address, what is grief and why do we experience it? What is grief? A definition I found online is grief, deep, prolonged mental anguish, intense sorrow, emotional suffering caused by loss, a disaster or misfortune, especially by the death of a loved one. If you have ever experienced grief or are experiencing it right now, I'm sure you agree with me that that definition doesn't do it justice. What we feel is so much worse than words can possibly describe. I might put it like this. Grief, an assortment of feelings that last a long, long time. Feelings ranging from shock, disbelief, anger, rage, fear, sadness, sickness, uncontrollable hysterical crying to the point of being buckled over in pain with no relief in sight, having a feeling of emptiness that certainly life will never be the same again, not being able to concentrate, having other areas of my life suffer, including massive miscommunications in my relationships with my spouse, my siblings, my friends, and my coworkers. Simply put, my life feels like it's falling apart. To me, Grief is the most painful human emotion we will ever experience. Period. End of subject. Why does grief have to hurt so bad if death is so normal? We are all human beings. Our parents meet. We get created. Then we get born into life. Then we live our life. And then we die. If you are grieving right now, I guarantee you, you are not alone. Let's look at some numbers. First of all, for the last 200,000 years, our Earth has been spinning with human beings living on it. In the world, there are over 124 million human births every year and 52 million deaths. Every day in the United States alone, there are 11,000 births and over 6,500 deaths. A birth occurs as a miracle, and we rejoice, we celebrate. Out of nothing, a cute little life gets created, and we feel incredible love for that little being. Then, we return to nothing in death. As normal as death is, we rarely celebrate it. Our religious beliefs tell us that we should, but do we really? No. What do we do when someone dies? We don't celebrate. We grieve. Again, grief is the most painful emotion known to mankind, yet it is something we must all go through in our lives. Grieving is not taught in schools and remains a mystery until we are faced with it. Unfortunately, it may be difficult to learn about grief while you're grieving because your brain is literally rewiring itself in survival mode to deal with a new reality after your significant loss. So, just do the best you can while you're listening to this, and every time you listen to it, I promise you'll hear something new. You'll learn shortly that an incredible amount of energy is used by the brain for grieving. The areas of your brain that are readjusting are the same areas you use for memory, learning, perception, and communication. So, not only is it hard to learn while you're grieving, but you'll find listening and retaining information is not easy and your work and relationships may suffer. You'll find people saying things to you like, 
I already told you that. Weren't you listening? Or someone will be talking to you, and you'll want to respond, but you just can't come up with the right words to say. You'll try to recall something you know well. That word will be right on the tip of your tongue, but it doesn't come to mind. Your perception can be way off, too. You don't think so because you are the one living in your brain, but others will see it and feel it. Your boss may ask, what time will you have the report in by? What you perceive is, he thinks I'm not doing my job. He is always on my back. I can't stand him. I'm going to look for another job. What really happened? Your boss just asked you a simple question, and you made all that meaning up. Or how about this? You and your siblings have always been reasonably close. You've heard stories about how families come apart when there's a death in the family, and you vow that will never happen to us. Then your mom passes away. Every single one of you is now grieving, and if your dad is still around, he's grieving too. You get together to discuss what to do next and how to handle mom's funeral arrangements. Besides your perception being way off, childhood memories come flooding back and the miscommunications begin. Your sister immediately talks about what's going to happen to mom's wedding ring, something mom had promised her. She's grieving, wants the ring because it was special to mom. We want to be with a person so bad that somewhere we feel if we have one of their prized possessions, we'll feel better. Unfortunately, it doesn't work this way. So the poor girl wants the ring so she can be close to her mom's memory. How might the other siblings perceive this? She's greedy. I knew it. She's going to go after everything. She was the oldest. You watch, and she'll play that, while mom and dad were working, I had to look after you guys, crap again. Your brother, the psychologist, brings up the fact that you all need to remain calm and address things one at a time. Perhaps make a list. The perception of another sibling? He was mom's favorite. He could do no wrong in her eyes. He got the good grades, went off to college. Now he helps people. He's the male Mother Teresa. But if he's so special, why isn't he married? Why doesn't he have a family? People go into the careers they most need. He was so messed up, so he went on to learn psychology. Make a list. Ha! Huh. Now, you're one of five adult children who just lost their mom, all with varied perceptions, not having a clue what's happening in your brain during grief. The result? I hate to say it, but more families separate and relationships end after grieving than stay together. One note, if you or someone you love has been diagnosed with an illness, there is something called anticipatory grief. You will experience grief, whether or not a person is cured from a disease or passes away. If the person dies, you will feel the grief before and after their death. Why I bring this up now is that studies prove marriages often come apart after someone has been diagnosed with a life-threatening disease, say cancer, for instance. The person with cancer may decide to fight to beat the illness and spend every moment in their life doing the things they've always wanted to do. So they get busy writing a book, traveling, seeing people, being active, living their life. The spouse? Scared to death to lose their loved one. They are experiencing anticipatory grief. They don't remember what the spouse said about making the most of their life. Their perception is way off and they are subconsciously preparing for that person to die. They now become clingy. They're very sad. They want to do everything for that person. They don't want to leave their side. They don't understand why the sick person wants to be out of the house, working and traveling. There are a couple options here. This couple could grow apart, could get divorced, regardless of whether the person dies or not. The person dies and the other lives with regrets the rest of his or her life. Or the last choice, the couple could listen to the CD, understand grief, and mend their relationship. I really do believe that with knowledge comes power. Our bodies cannot survive death, period. We and our loved ones will all experience grief. 
and it is going to hurt really, really bad. In fact, the older we get, the more grief we'll experience. But what can we do to educate ourselves about grief? What it is, what we can expect, and how we can navigate our way through it. We can use our energy that we normally spend fighting or regretting or thinking about the situation to actually heal ourselves and get on with our lives. So let me talk more about why we grieve. The reason we grieve is because we love. If we didn't have love and connections to others, we wouldn't grieve. Think about people you don't know very well that died. Now, you may feel a little bad for their family and friends, but you didn't know that person so well, so it really doesn't affect you. However, take someone or something close to you that dies a person or a pet that you love and cherish and probably have spent many, many years with, the pain of grief can be crippling. Most of us who have felt grief agree that we'd rather have a limb cut off than lose someone we love. At least we know physical pain eventually heals. Healing from grief has no guarantees. It could take six months. It could take years. We all grieve and heal in different time. I believe grief certainly does lessen over time, but that feeling of missing another, well, that'll never quite go away. Let's look to the brain for some answers about grief. Not only do humans grieve, but animals grieve. Grief is essential for the survival of a species. Let's look at it this way. Imagine a bear cub raised by its mother, relying solely on his mother for food and protection. One day, the mother is gone, and now the bear must survive on its own. The bear feels grief. He goes into shock. The bond he has had with his mother is gone. In order to survive, his brain must rewire itself and become accustomed to the fact that there is no mother now to feed and protect him, that he is now responsible for his own survival. Without grief, the bear would either starve to death or become prey to another animal. Human beings act the same way as animals. Our bodies and our minds get used to the sights, the sounds, the touch, and the smell of another person. This is done through chemicals present in our bodies. When we are in the presence of such a person, a particular mix of neurotransmitters and hormones are produced. This forms a physiological identity of the other person in the body, and a bond is created in our brains. We call this bond love. Let me talk more about these neurotransmitters. It is important to realize as you grieve, the human brain operates much like an automobile on fluids called neurotransmitters. Just as your automobile has brake fluid, antifreeze, transmission fluid, and oil, your brain runs on these neurotransmitters. Some give us energy, like those related to adrenaline. Some control body movements, dopamine as an example, and some control mood. The brain neurotransmitter associated with grief and depression is called serotonin. Serotonin is a slow-acting neurotransmitter that is associated with sleep, appetite, alertness, energy, memory, concentration, and mood. When a person we're close to dies, we no longer can experience that person alive. And due to the stress on our system, more serotonin is used up by the body than can be replaced. Our minds are conditioned to have that person alive. When the person dies, the system goes haywire and into turmoil. Depending on the degree of the bond, the body may go into shock. During the grieving process, the brain continuously uses serotonin much faster than it can make it. Memory fails. Perception gets over-exaggerated. Fear, anger, disbelief, denial, and sadness set in. All part of the grieving process due to lack of serotonin. However, one day the weeping and the grieving will end. And at that point, the body becomes emotionally and physiologically stable and calms down. 
Grieving is then over. You'll know your serotonin level is low by the following symptoms. Your sleep is off. You find yourself not being able to sleep or sleeping at strange hours. Serotonin, you see, controls our sleep cycle. Concentration and attention will drop. Grieving children and students will probably experience a drop in their grades. You'll start putting odd things in the refrigerator, for example. Perhaps you'll find your cell phone in there. Forget why you went to the grocery store and become very forgetful and scatterbrained at work or at home. You'll lose physical energy. You can sleep for 10 hours and you'll still be dog tired. You will cry at the drop of a hat, driving down the highway, doing dishes, sitting at work, etc. Another interesting note. Crying is an important part of the grieving process for toxins to be released from our system. In fact, the tears of a grieving person are of a completely different chemical makeup than that of any other tears. Sexual interest, appetite, and general interest will rapidly drop. You will stop answering the phone, stop visiting friends and relatives, and just pull the blinds. You will feel like just being alone. Each human brain is unique. How long it takes to adjust varies from one individual to another. It will depend on the particular brain and also the magnitude and significance of the change. There is no point in fighting, reasoning, or attempting to eliminate or heal the grieving process because it is a basic survival task and it's not an illness. Although the adjustment process can feel awful, it's actually a natural and very much needed process. To fight the adjustment process or try to eliminate it is as senseless as trying to fight the fact that we need food, drink, or sleep. We will not only fail, but also risk doing serious damage to ourselves. As uncomfortable and painful as the grieving process may feel, it is essential to our brains and must be experienced fully. Emotions must not be blocked or interrupted. When grieving people are prescribed antidepressants, the medication can interfere and stop them from feeling something that they must feel in order for the adjustment process to complete itself successfully in the brain. Any drug, prescription medication, alcohol, caffeine, sugar, nicotine, that people take to try to numb their emotions during grief is likely to do them harm in the long run. This is because avoiding the feelings we feel during grief can have the effect of blocking or slowing down the grief process. Blocking grief comes at a great cost because it means that we do not adjust to our new reality and therefore cannot be in it and cannot function properly and fully. There is such a thing as normal grief, and it is very, very painful. Next, I want to cover some red flags you should watch out for, and when it is time to see your doctor. If you have seen your doctor prior to listening to this, and he or she has prescribed you an antidepressant, stay on it. No two human beings are exactly alike. Some may be grieving much worse than others, and it is important to follow your physician's advice. The implications of not grieving can be serious. What's happening in your mind is not accurately recreating the reality you live in. By trying to turn off or not allow grief, you may develop real depression and then suffer physical symptoms in your relationships and work performance will suffer. Here's a few red flags of too low serotonin level and when you should see your doctor. Most dangerous is when your mind speed increases. Your mind will often race at what seems like 200 miles per hour. Severely depressed and grieving people often tell their doctor, I just can't get my mind to stop. The minute I wake up in the morning, it starts up. Your brain will then turn against you. It will reach in your memory banks and pull out every bad memory it can find. Arguments with the now deceased person, how you failed them, anything to make you feel bad and especially guilty. You will be tortured by your own thoughts. As your mind speed picks up, the garbage truck will arrive. While the brain is already torturing you with the past, it will create or invent new ideas and thoughts to torture you. In every case of depression, if the depression stays long enough, you will receive the same garbage thoughts from your mind. Your mind will tell you, you are a burden to your family and friends. You have failed and disappointed your family. No one really cares about you. Your children would be better off raised by someone else. Your family would be better off without you. You would be better off dead. Remember, these are all red flags, not true, and this is the time to see your physician.
as part of the garbage truck your mind will try to make you as uncomfortable as possible you may be flooded with thoughts of violence against yourself or others you'll think you're being condemned by god or you'll think you deserve this condition for some reason your garbage will also tell you that if you seek professional help that you'll be committed to an institution forever please realize that you have a very low level of serotonin and it is a must to see your doctor if you have any question whether your grieving is normal or not see your doctor i can't say this enough if in doubt see your doctor for normal grief with normal low serotonin levels the only way to end grief is to actually live through it and let the brain spend the time rewiring itself for your survival unfortunately we can feel numb uncertain in disbelief depressed angry vulnerable confused and often afraid during this time the process of grief is physical building new brain connections and neural networks is tiring it uses up a lot of energy and while the brain does that we don't have much mental energy left for anything else one of the biggest problems in grief is that we have no choice whether we want to grieve or not and must continue to use the same brain while it is going through the adjustment we must continue to work make decisions take care of our family maintain relationships etc this is where life gets difficult because our brain considers adjustment to change crucial to survival it will make it a top priority to grieve and will allocate as much energy and resources as possible to the adjustment process this is because from our brain's point of view we are in danger as long as our mental image of reality doesn't match our actual reality everything else that we have to do just has to take a back seat our brain doesn't care that we have to go to work raise children pay bills drive cars run businesses care for others cook and do the shopping in today's reality most of us have a lot to do life is filled with responsibilities and commitments and during the adjustment process our brain will not leave us enough energy to function as we usually do this can leave many people feeling terribly inadequate and dysfunctional in a world where we must work with others and live with others the grieving process puts an incredible strain on our relationships over a hundred years ago grieving was not what it is today back then many children grew up on farms saw animals die as well as watched the death of their elders the old or sick family members were cared for by the family and the family took care of them during their final days even after death it was the family's responsibility to wash and dress the body and have the wake at the house families worked together and stayed together during the grieving process death was normal yes sad and painful but a normal part of life people's brains a hundred years ago were not thrown into such a survival mode because experiencing death was a normal part of life grieving then was not nearly as torturous as it is today why is it so torturous today today we don't see much of death we live our lives unconsciously thinking that death happens to other people our elders and sick die in hospitals and nursing homes it's rare that we see a farm let alone see a farm and see the birth and death of animals death is kept quiet and away from society for the most part we have not been given any tools that our elders had for dealing with death and grief then without knowing death hits your life you get a phone call that someone close to you has died and your brain goes full force into survival mode to readjust to the significant change or you find out that someone you love has a life-threatening illness and is going to die again this is what we call anticipatory grief you experience the same shock and emotions associated with grief even though that person has not died let's talk about grief and greed the words grief and greed often seem to go hand in hand remember i said earlier that grief puts us in survival mode very often it is an unconscious decision but grieving people they relate survival to the amount of money they have deep down they think they'll be better off in life if they get their hands on mom's jewelry or if they have a larger inheritance regardless if their actions will cause upsets and break apart their family that will never happen to me and my family you think well sorry to say 
there's a good chance it will. Most families I spoke with said this very thing. My family was so close, I would have never dreamed this would happen. Or, my brother and I were so close, I can't believe he got this greedy. Or, my wife was always so loving, I cannot believe that she is so cold to me. A term that often comes up in conversations is true colors, such as someone's true colors coming out if they are selfish, angry, financially greedy, or void of emotion, such as no longer being loving or compassionate with others. I ask you right now to consider that people's true colors are the attributes and mannerisms that the person has had consistently in life, not in this time of grief. Deep down, people are still those same loving, generous, kind, compassionate, fun to be with human beings. But when they experience grief, the body goes into shock and a new temporary set of crazy emotions take over as the brain is looking for survival. Grief is a very hard journey on anyone. We need our friends and family to be there for us, to listen to us, to be a shoulder to cry on, to look to them for support. However, this can be a very hard thing for a family to do because they are going through grief as well. Their brains are being used for their own survival. So chances are there won't be room for them to be compassionate about your needs. I hope to save some families and relationships from the pain of coming apart. Another reason for this, if you get divorced from a spouse or even right off a family member, you will grieve the loss of that person or that relationship as well as the person that died. We need people when we grieve. If the grieving process is properly understood, I hope for more people to have compassion with each other, no matter if it's happening now or if it's something that happened 20 years ago. It's never too late. Please, 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 please be gentle and compassionate with yourself and others during grief. Unless you are in someone else's shoes, you don't know how difficult of a time it is for them. Do your best to listen. Don't make them wrong for their behavior and just love them. Thankfully, with mutual respect and patience, relationships can withstand and even sometimes grow stronger due to grief. Perhaps the greatest mistake someone attempting to comfort or console another can make is to insist on how the other must be feeling. Instead, friends and relatives of the bereaved should be patient with whatever emotions the individual may be feeling without deciding whether these emotions are right or appropriate. Most grievers need to talk and often repeat the same story over and over again. Be a listener. Ask them if there is anything you can do for them. Let them know you'll always have an ear for them. Every human being will grieve and we all need support. What not to say to someone grieving? Here's a couple examples. Well, they had a good long life. It was their time. Or God needed another angel in heaven. What to say? I'm here for you. I care. I'm not in your shoes to know what you're feeling, but I do care about you. And I'll do whatever you need, even if you just need somebody to listen. People will appreciate those words and they may not take you up on your support. Grief is often a solitary experience, and the only way through it can be to be alone. Others will never be able to understand exactly how you may be feeling, so be patient with whatever may come, and that will help the relationship stay strong. If it is believed that grief is really interfering with your life, then counseling may be in order. I chose to include the technical aspect of what is happening in the brain during grief so you can be gentle on yourself and your loved ones who may be grieving. The body has no choice but to grieve, no matter if you feel you should or shouldn't feel a certain way. Remember, grieving people are in survival mode. There is no choice in the matter of grieving or not. I'm going to really go into a lot of detail here about things we experience during grief. Again, knowledge is power. While you're grieving, it is so easy to think something is wrong with you and feel you must be different from other people and that you have a problem. 
when you can replay the CD and listen and re-listen to all of the stages and side effects from grief, especially during the times you're stuck in one, it will be easier to unstick yourself, so to speak. You'll listen to this and think, ah, yes, I'm in the angry stage. And all fingers crossed, you'll be able to let it go. And in that moment, your serotonin level has a chance to start replenishing itself for healing. The five stages of grief. The five most well-known stages were introduced by a Swiss-born psychiatrist, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, that spent over 40 years working with thousands of dying children, adults, and their families. Please be advised, it is a common misconception that these stages happen in order. For instance, some may feel that they must go through one stage before they get to another. Not true. At any time in your grief, any one of these may appear. Very often, we experience them many times. You'll see on the cover of the CD the five stages of grief. Denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. Elizabeth herself said that these stages could come up in any order and at any time. Here are the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief. One, denial. Denial is a conscious or unconscious refusal to accept facts, information, reality, etc. It's a defense mechanism and perfectly natural. Two, anger. Anger can manifest in different ways. Grieving people can be angry with themselves, with others, especially those close to them. Many intense feelings of blame get directed towards others, relatives, friends, doctors, who did not seem to help the person enough before their death. It is so common to feel anger at oneself for failing to prevent a death, blaming oneself for not doing more. Feelings of anger towards the person who has just died are often particularly distressing and confusing. The bereaved may feel abandoned by them. Feelings of anger are at their most intense shortly after a death and will naturally subside. Knowing anger is normal may help you keep detached and non-judgmental when experiencing the anger of someone who's very upset. Anger is a natural and common response to loss. It is rare to experience no anger during grief at all. And for some people, feelings of rage can be very intense. The protest, why me, reflects a general sense of helplessness at the unfairness of life, as does anger at others for carrying on with their lives as if nothing has happened. Three, bargaining. Traditionally, the bargaining stage for people facing death can involve attempting to bargain with God or whoever the person believes in. God, I promise to be a much better person if you just take my wife's cancer away. People facing less serious trauma can bargain or seek to negotiate a compromise. For example, can we still be friends when facing a romantic breakup? Bargaining rarely provides a sustainable solution, even if it's a matter of life or death. Number four, depression, also referred to as preparatory grieving. It's sort of an acceptance with emotional attachment. It's natural to feel sadness and regret, fear, uncertainty, etc. It shows that the person has at least begun to accept the reality. And number five, acceptance. Again, this stage definitely varies according to the person's situation. Although broadly, it is an indication that there is some emotional detachment from the situation. People dying can often enter acceptance a long time before the people they leave behind and this can cause quite an upset. Since Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's death in 2004, there has been much more work in the area of grief, and there are actually stages within stages. Now I will cover these again. They may be felt at any time. Shock. The death of someone close to you comes as a tremendous shock. When someone dies unexpectedly, this shock is intensified especially when someone takes their own life or dies in a violent way. Shock is common during the days and weeks immediately following a death. Some experience it more severely and for a longer period of time than others. Numbness. Unfortunately, your mind only allows you to feel your loss slowly. And following the death of someone you have been close to, you may experience feelings of numbness. What has happened may seem unreal or dreamlike. The thought, this can't be happening, 
may occur. The numbness of early bereavement may itself be a source of distress and misunderstanding. If one wonders, for example, well, why didn't I cry at the funeral? In fact, this numbness is only delaying emotional reactions and may actually be a help in getting through the practical arrangements. The protection provided by shock gradually wears off and emotional pain begins. Disbelief. It is natural to have difficulty believing what has just happened. Where a death was untimely and sudden, it is even harder to grasp the fact the loss is permanent and real. On one level, it is possible to know that a loved one has died, but on another, deeper level, it may seem impossible to accept. A large part of you will resist the knowledge that the person who has just died is not going to be around anymore. Confusion, panic, and fear are common during this struggle between knowing they have died and disbelief. Searching, numbness, and shock tend to give way to an overwhelming sense of loss. Many bereaved people find themselves instinctively searching for their loved ones, even though they know that they are dead. This may involve calling out their name, talking to their photographs, dreaming they are back, or looking out for them amongst people in a crowd. This denial of a painful reality is a natural part of mourning. Anguish and longing. The understanding that a loved one is really dead brings with it tremendous misery and sadness. As the loss begins to make itself felt, longing for the person who has died is common. And desperate yearnings to see them, to touch them, to talk to them may be felt. You may cling desperately to one of their belongings just to feel close to them. The intensity of emotions is often frightening and may leave the bereaved feeling devastated. Emotional pain is often accompanied by physical pain. It is common to go over and over in your mind what has happened, replaying these things in your head or talking them through. The need to talk about a loved one following their death is part of the natural struggle to counteract the loss. Physical and emotional stress. Losing someone close to you is a major source of stress. This stress may show itself in both physical and mental ways. Restlessness, sleeplessness, and fatigue are common. You may also have bad dreams, loss of memory, and loss of concentration. You may experience dizziness, palpitations, shakes, difficulty breathing. Intense emotional pain may be accompanied by physical pain. Sadness may feel like a pain within. Muscular tension may lead to headaches, neck and back aches. Loss of appetite and nausea are also very common. Guilt or self-blame is also common during grief. Guilt may be felt about the death itself. It is extremely painful to accept that we were not able to prevent the death of a loved one or protect them. Feelings of responsibility are common, and bereaved people often judge themselves harshly under these circumstances. Our relationships before the death are another common source of remorse. Since our lives are not usually conducted as if every day might be our last, we assume that there'll always be a future to sort out tensions and arguments or to say things that have been left unsaid. Regrets often take the form of if onlys. If only I had done this, or if only I had done that. Guilt may also be aroused by what one feels or does not feel during bereavement. Example, guilt about feeling anger towards a dead person, guilt about your inability to cry or show grief openly. Occasionally, a death may bring with it a sense of relief for those left behind, particularly if there had been a lot of unhappiness or suffering for the deceased or everyone beforehand. This feeling may also cause intense guilt. Lastly, guilt may be felt for surviving, for being alive when the other is dead. Despair. Feelings of despair are common during grieving. Once it's realized that despite all the anguish and longing, a loved one will not be coming back. Relationships often suffer because despair is draining and you may feel no interest in each other. The bereaved may be left feeling both powerless and hopeless. Life may no longer seem to make any sense or have any meaning. Feelings of not giving a damn about anything are common. 
as is indifference as to what happens to you. In the aftermath of death, suicidal feelings are not uncommon. Fear. Fear is common during grief. Violent and confusing emotions, panic and nightmares may make grief a frightening experience. You may fear a similar event happening again. You may fear for yourself and those you love. You may fear losing control or breaking down. Grief and depression. The feelings of the newly bereaved have a lot in common with those suffering from depression. Like depression, grief can bring profound sadness and despair. Feelings of unreality are common. It may seem hard to find a way forward. Grief interferes with sleep, with concentration, and with appetite. For a grieving person, these feelings are part of a natural response to a terrible loss. People who are grieving are likely to be more prone to sadness and depression for a number of years. For some, these feelings may be particularly severe and prolonged. When grief gives way to a longer-lasting depression, further help may be needed. As I said in the beginning of this audio, the length of grief and its quality also depend on how well you accommodate it. So let's start talking about that. Caring for yourself. The loss of someone close to you is unbelievably stressful. It can help you to cope if you take care of yourself in certain small but important ways. Here are some things that might help. Know that you can and will heal over time. Repeat listening to this audio daily if necessary. You are not alone and you will get through this. It hurts tremendously, but what you're feeling is normal. Participate in rituals, memorial services, funerals, and other traditions. Traditions help people get through the first few days and honor the person who died. Be with others. Even in formal gatherings of family and friends, bring a sense of support and help people not feel so isolated in the first few days and weeks of grief. Talk about it when you can. Some people find it helpful to tell their story of their loss or talk about their feelings. Sometimes a person doesn't feel like talking, and that's okay too. No one should feel pressured to talk. You will eventually stop talking about it, but keep on talking until that day comes. Express yourself. Even if you don't feel like talking, find ways to express your emotions or thoughts. Start by writing in a journal about the memories you have about the person you lost and how you're feeling since the loss. Or write a song, a poem, or tribute about your loved one. You don't have to show it to anyone. Exercise. Exercise can help your mood. It may be hard to get motivated, so modify your usual routine if you need to. Try not to think about it too much. Just put on your sneakers and go outside for a walk. Sunshine will do you good as well. Eat right. You may feel like skipping meals or may not feel hungry, but your body still needs nutritious foods. Join a support group. If you think you may be interested in attending a support group, look on the internet for grief support groups. You can also join online support groups. It often helps to post your feelings and hear stories from others. The thing to remember is that you do not have to be alone with your feelings or your pain. Let your emotions be expressed and released. Don't stop yourself from having a good cry if you feel one coming on. Don't worry if listening to particular songs or doing certain activities is painful because it brings back memories of the person that you just lost. This is common. After a while, it really does become less painful. Create a memorial or tribute. Plant a tree or garden or memorialize the person in some fitting way, such as running a charity walk or doing something in their behalf. There are now websites you can create in memory of a loved one. I made one of these websites in honor of my dad. This not only got my mind on something positive, but it helped his friends as well. Those who couldn't attend his funeral had a place to post a picture or a condolence message for our family. Getting help for intense grief. I'm going to revisit this topic because it is important. If your grief isn't letting up for a while after the death of your loved one, you may want to reach out for help. If grief has turned into depression, it is very important to talk to someone. How do you know if your grief has been going on too long? Here are some signs. You've been grieving for four months or more and you aren't feeling any better. You feel profoundly depressed. Your grief is so intense that you can't go on with your normal activities. Your grief is affecting your ability to concentrate, sleep, 
eat, socialize, and do the things you normally do. You feel you can't go on living after the loss where you think about suicide, dying, or hurting yourself. It's natural for loss to cause people to think about death to some degree, but if a loss has caused you to think about suicide or hurting yourself in some way, or if you feel that you can't go on living, it's important that you tell someone right away. Counseling with a professional therapist can help because it allows you to talk about your loss and express strong feelings. Many counselors specialize in working with teens and children who are struggling with loss and depression. If you'd like to talk to a therapist or you're not too sure where to begin, talk to your doctor. They often have excellent resources. Other ways to lessen the pain of grief. One way is faith. Do you have strong beliefs about life and death? Were you raised in a religion that believes our departed loved ones go to heaven or reincarnated or some other belief? It may be extremely helpful for you to get involved with your religion right now and speak to a member of the clergy or attend regular services. Be active. When you get involved in a project or volunteer to make a difference for another, it may take your mind off your loss for a little while. Again, this activity will let a little serotonin start being replenished in your brain. Be with children or animals. The laughter of a child or visiting a pet store and petting the puppies can definitely bring your spirits up. Do something that you enjoy. Perhaps play some of your favorite music, read a good book, call a friend, go to a movie. Probably the last thing you feel like doing, but it will give your mind a break and cause some healing to occur. Unfortunately, even during these activities, you're in the adjustment period and waves of grief will still hit you. I work as a chef and remember making a big batch of scrambled eggs for a breakfast I was serving and having many people around. Just then I burst into tears uncontrollably, thinking about the loss of my wonderful grandmother. Our brains still need to go through the adjustment period, no matter what distraction we give it. These waves of grief are often very intense, most of the time without a signal that they're coming on. For lack of a better expression, we must ride the wave, experience the pain, the sadness, the tears, and all the emotions for them to dissipate from our bodies. Anger, rage, fear, dread, guilt, denial, and other emotions will all surface. It is important to feel these feelings and to notice what it is that you're feeling. As much as it may hurt, it is a normal way for your body to process grief. Please note, I told you to experience these emotions, not act on them. For example, if anger does come up, do not yell at your boss or coworker. If you feel guilty, do not sit there stewing on it for two hours in guilt. Rather notice, I'm feeling guilty, and feel what it feels like to feel guilt in your body. Eventually, those sensations will dissipate. One great practice any time you are overcome with grief is to practice being in the present moment. Quick, find something where you are to pay attention to. Right now, I see a sneaker under the coffee table in my living room. Notice the size, the color, the laces, perhaps the dirt, all the intricate details and textures of that sneaker. Fully investigate that sneaker thoroughly, how it feels to your fingertips. You may not wish to smell it, but you get the idea. You know what you just did? You recircuited some brain patterns in your mind. Now, How do you use this while grieving? Anytime you get flooded with those unbearable feelings of grief, get in the present moment. First, recognize what your body is doing. For instance, being incredibly sad and hysterically crying. Get into the present moment and notice what your body is doing. Well, I'm producing a lot of tears and I can hardly breathe. My heart is racing, my stomach feels sick, and I sure feel like I have a lot of pressure on my chest. From there, find something to bring you even more into the moment. Find something like the sneaker to concentrate on or stop all of your senses but your hearing. Listen intently to the world around you, hearing every creak of the building you're in, every note of a song you're listening to, paying 100% attention to every sound you hear. You can do this with your sense of touch and taste too. You can feel the texture of something under your fingertips or if you're dining, Mindfully taste every bite and experience the texture, flavors, and where on the tongue the flavors impact you. 
We, as humans, develop habits of grieving like we develop any other habit, good or bad. You may have a good habit of brushing your teeth, but you might have a very bad habit of feeling guilt. For instance, you keep thinking about what you should have said to the person or what you shouldn't have said to that person. Now, the more you think that particular thought, the more it becomes implanted as a habit, and the more you'll do it. There are actually neural patterns being created in your brain each and every time you think something. So, if you want to lessen grief, you must realize that any time you think a reoccurring negative thought, you are actually increasing your grieving time. Nip these habits in the bud. When you can catch yourself going down a path of thinking too much or worrying too much, pay attention to what you're thinking too. Get in the present moment and pay attention to whatever's right in front of you, even if it's just hanging onto that steering wheel as you drive. Please remember, have compassion for yourself and for others. We are only human. Using this present moment technique is not only valuable for lessening and shortening painful grieving, but it has an extraordinary side effect. You may have some great new ideas and great thoughts. You've heard of people who meditate? It's the same as my present moment technique. Meditation has been used around the world for thousands of years. No, you don't have to sit with your legs crossed in the lotus position and say, Om. It's actually very simple to do. Just be in the present moment, not thinking. Well, it's simple, but unfortunately, we are human beings with a voice in our head that never shuts up. So the art of meditation is just never giving up. The more you do it, the longer the periods happen that that voice is silent. Try this now. Concentrate on your breathing. Pay attention only to the breaths that come in and go out. If that little voice in your head wasn't talking to you at the same time, you have just effectively meditated. The voice or thoughts will come flooding back, so just get back to concentrating on your breath again. By the way, have you done any reading on some of the famous inventors and most brilliant minds? People like Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison, Winston Churchill, Alexander Graham Bell, Amadeus Mozart, Henry Ford, Andrew Carnegie, and Leonardo da Vinci all have spoken about going to that quiet place in their mind and attributing that place of stillness to where all their great ideas came from. By the way, you cannot experience pain and grief when you're in the present moment. By practicing this, you will feel moments free from sadness, I promise. The more you do this, meaning the longer you can stay in the present moment, the less pain you will experience. Be forewarned, if you practice quieting the mind, you may actually have an incredible thought or image of a loved one or an idea for a new invention show up. Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, longed for a son. After the death of his prematurely born son, Bell was grieving. During his grief, he saw the image of the vacuum jacket, as he called it, and invented it. That was the predecessor of the iron lung. The more you practice being in the present moment, the more you will find new thoughts coming to your mind. Pay attention to the ones that inspire you. You may have an idea of writing a book or getting into art and creating something. You may have an idea of getting involved with a group or starting a new business. Keep notes on your ideas, and in time, you'll have enough inspiration to go forward with it. There is a lot of energy used while grieving. This energy could be redirected towards something that inspires you. Imagine actually being excited about something and taking steps to accomplish it. You can certainly speed up your grieving process with that present moment technique I just talked about. The gift of grief is also possible. In the moments of grief, some people actually realize what their life is for and what they're meant to do. Let's talk now a little bit about the conversation of life after death. There are people that claim to be mediums that supposedly connect to our deceased loved ones. There are near-death experiences that hundreds of thousands have claimed to have. There are many claims that a deceased person has shown up in a dream or that people have heard their loved one's voice calling them, being absolutely sure it is really them. Many of the scientists that got involved with studying life after death did so accidentally. In fact, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross had no interest or belief in the subject. 
however after being by the bedside of thousands of children and adults and hearing very similar experiences of people seeing what heaven looks like or seeing an angel or a deceased relative by the bedside just before their own death she chose to do research on the subject and came to believe that there is definitely life after death by the way these days more and more people are sedated before they die so we don't hear too many of these stories what if life after death was true what if the person you lost was still out there whether you call it heaven or being in a different vibration what if they were only a thought away and they really could visit you and be with you but you couldn't see them would your life be any different would you spend the months the years grieving thinking that you should have done something different or not able to move on with your own life because that person had lost their life here's the truth folks many people's hopes and dreams die when a person they love dies figuratively speaking they stop living themselves oh there can't be life after death i don't believe that stuff those mediums and psychics are frauds just out to scam people for their money i too was one of those disbelievers unless i can experience something for myself it can't be real period however for some reason fifteen years ago i had this huge fear of dying so i began to search for something anything to calm my fears i'm not going to get into all that now but you can certainly read about that on my website what's important now for me to share are there are some things you can experience now to open your mind to the possibility of life after death that your loved ones really are still around are you open to try again i want to be clear i am not here to push any of my beliefs on anyone instead if i can give you a couple of things to open yourself up to the possibility that maybe we survive physical death then possibly not only will your grieving take less time and you can go back to living but you can go have one heck of a great life for yourself you can go after your dreams, you can fail, you can try again, you can succeed, and have some of the things you desire most. Would that be a life worth living? Would that be worth trying a few of the things I mentioned? If you say yes, continue listening. Just a few weeks ago, I met up with a medium here in Massachusetts, where I live. Not only is she a medium, but she is an artist and will draw a picture of who she sees in her mind's eye. Although I do believe in life after death, my dad passed away from cancer less than a year ago, and I miss him terribly. It's been 10 months, and although I've been doing well, and most of the painful days are gone, there are still moments when that sadness is so incredibly tough. There are moments when I miss him so very much. While this medium was sketching the portrait of my dad, she was telling me some things that seemed to me to be straight from my father's mouth. She told me the month when my dad first started feeling the pain in his back. She pointed to the exact spot where my dad would point to and told the story of how the pain progressed and how he walked with a walker. For the skeptics out there, I know she could have looked all this up and blah, 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 blah. But I can tell you she didn't. I'm in Massachusetts. My dad was in Florida. That's all impossible. She then demonstrated the way my dad would get out of a chair, leaning way over and putting his hands as far back on the seat of the chair as possible, and pushing himself up. Then explained how he had to use a wheelchair. My dad had cancer in his spine, and several weeks before he died, he would hold his abdominal area and just say to me, Sandra, it's tight. It feels so tight. That's how he explained that pain, as tightness. This medium then held her abdominal area and said to me, It's tight. It feels so tight. I was speechless. She also drew a portrait of my dad. The portrait maybe looked like a young version of my dad, but truthfully, the picture didn't have to sell me on dad still being around. The words from her mouth did. By the way, I was there with her over an hour. There were a lot more relevant things she told me. One thing this medium and I discussed was the power of being in the present moment. Did you know that all the mediums and the psychics out there have to be in that same place mentally to do their thing? They cannot be thinking about their shopping list or the time they have to pick up their kids after school. They must focus their attention on you and clear the mental chatter in their minds. Personally, I believe that if there is any message your deceased loved one wants to give you, you have to be in the present moment to receive it. Once I was driving my car on autopilot and I completely zoned out, I suddenly got the feeling my grandmother was in the passenger seat. 
It was just for a brief moment, but I could feel her love there. I could actually even tell what she was wearing. Could it be my imagination? Absolutely. But I can believe what I want to believe, just as you can. Another time I was in the shower, feeling very sad as the hot water hit my back, and I got a picture of my dad in my mind. There he was, wearing a yellow shirt and blue jeans, a little younger than I remembered, no glasses, tanned, and a big smile on his face. Loud and clear, I heard him say this in my mind. Sweetie Pie, where you are is temporary. Where I am is forever. You are there to learn and love. Think about what you are grateful for, and you'll feel better. When Dad was in the hospital, he and I used to play a game when he was sick. We would go back and forth telling each other what we were grateful for. This made us both feel better, and it flooded Dad's body with those feel-good endorphins, lessening the pain he was feeling. I wish I could promise you a heaven or eternity or happily ever after. I cannot. But you can have faith, and you can do a heck of a lot of research and some very cool exercises that may convince you of a life after death like they've convinced me. I really do believe that our loved ones are still with us. If you are interested in this kind of thing, again, you can go to my website. My website is www.wedontdie.com. I have links and names and books you can read and videos to watch. I really don't want you to take my word for it that there is life after death. Explore it for yourself. Plus, it'll get your mind off your grief. Once again, raising serotonin levels. One exercise that you can do right now after listening to this is what's called remote viewing. When you experience remote viewing, you will be so wowed that you may think, gosh, if that's possible, why can't there be life after death? The father of remote viewing is physicist Russell Targ. Targ was one of the founding fathers of the laser beam. Brilliant in physics, he developed laser technology for airborne detection of wind shear and air turbulence. He has published countless papers on lasers, plasma physics, laser applications, and electro-optics. When I met Targ just a few years ago, I had gone to a weekend course that he offered in New York called Remote Viewing. As a child, Russell knew he knew things about people that he shouldn't normally know, like he'd meet somebody and he knew what kind of dog they had, or he could describe a room in someone's house, yet he never visited it. He knew there had to be something more. In 1972, Russell Targ, along with partner Harold Putoff, co-founded a 23-year, $25 million research with the U.S. government into psychic ability, working with the United States intelligence community, including the CIA, U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, and Army Intelligence. Remote viewing is very real, and Russell Targ's weekend course proved to everyone in our 60-person classroom that it was. There is not a single person on this planet that cannot remote view. I say, try it for yourself. Links to Russell Targ's work and his books are on my website. However, for right now, I can give you a few things to try to prove to yourself remote viewing is real. Take a partner. Have your partner put an object in a box. You can remote view the images of what is in the box. Or... Do this with a friend on the phone. Take turns. Ask the other to remote view any images of things they see on your coffee table. Or, no friends handy? Grab a magazine that you haven't looked at yet. You can remote view and see images inside the magazine. How does one remote view? First of all, you must be in the present moment. Did you hear me? The present moment. Have the intention, what is on my friend's coffee table, or what is in the box, or what pictures are in the magazine. Let me tell you one thing. Your brain will start telling you you're crazy, that this isn't possible, why did you buy that CD, this lady's nuts, all sorts of things. However, pictures will come to your mind. Write down the images you see. Your brain will see a lot of images, many of which you are simply making up. After a few minutes, take a little break, clear your mind, and then go back, set the intention, and do it again. Just let the images show up. Don't try to figure out what they mean. 
Again, stay in the present moment. Once you talk to your friend or open the magazine, you might be in a state of shock. Yes, you may have seen a white square with lots of numbers after your friend hid something in the box. What was in the box? A business card. Your friend's coffee table? Well, you wrote down on your notepad that you saw a banana, a rabbit, a piece of chocolate cake, an elephant, a plant, and a toothbrush. Again, our brains throw out a lot of rubbish. But what was actually on the coffee table? A ceramic elephant container that held a household plant. Magazines are great because you can practice these anytime without any people. Sure, you'd expect to find pictures of food in a cooking magazine. But what about if your mind threw out a picture of a bicycle or a ladybug or the Statue of Liberty? You see those in your mind, you flip through the magazine, and there they are. When this happens to you, and when I tell you when this happens, this will happen, you are left with this thought, who am I really that I can do this? Through my 15 years of research, I have found some 2,000 to 3,000 year old common beliefs about life after death. Whether or not you choose to believe them is up to you. But let me ask you, what would your life look like right now if you did believe them? What would your relationships look like? How much fear would you have? How much joy would you experience fulfilling some of those dreams you've had? So you want to hear these common beliefs? Here we go. First one, we are eternal souls having a human experience. Next, the earth is the only place we can experience a wide range of emotions, and experiencing these emotions is essential for our learning experience and for our souls to grow. We come to earth to learn certain lessons and are here for a certain amount of time. When our lesson is learned, we return home, go through a debriefing process, and choose to come back to learn more lessons or not. The purpose of life is to learn, to love, and most importantly, to forgive. Forgiving others, and especially ourselves, is critical for the growth of the soul. After death, we are still around, just in another dimension. We are only a thought away and can be back with the living invisibly any time we want. There is no time or space in the hereafter, so they are not grieving for us. To them, it's just a blink of an eye, and we'll all be together again. They will be waiting for us to die, and we will be together again in a place of infinite love. We can never die. Only our bodies do. Think about a dream you had recently while you were sleeping. Dreams seem so real, don't they? Then you wake up and you realize, oh, it was just a dream. Those hundreds of thousands of people that report having a near-death experience have a similar experience. They found the life they are living now to be so real then, when their bodies died for just those few minutes, say on an operating table, they were in a much, much more real place and realized the life we are living now is just a dream. I'm going to leave you with an old nursery rhyme. Listen to the words like you've never heard them before. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. You are the boat. Stay on the course. Gently maneuvering, not fighting the waters and paddling upstream. Be merry. Be happy. Life is but a dream. This is Sandra Champlain. Thank you for listening to How to Survive Grief. If this CD made a difference for you, please feel free to copy it and give it to others. Encourage people to listen to it before they experience grief. For more information about the grieving process and the latest information researchers are finding about our soul's survival, please visit my website, www.wedontdie.com. I look forward to hearing from you.